come up and sit in those three chairs. You can get closer together. And I can say that the, the reason I felt comfortable to say something to Kath is that I met her when I went to Australia in 2003 for ISMB, and it was not at the meeting. We were on the river going <laughs> to the koala park. <laughs> remember that I remember meeting it. It's like, yeah. oh, you look like you're from I you, Anyway. Yeah. But, I took 300 photos of koalas that day. Okay. <laughs> so, um, okay, so I'd like to first open this up to, uh, I guess, to the audience, although I guess I took a couple of notes saying one thing that people didn't explicitly talk about is having confidence in what they do. And I think that's a really important point that, that all of these people have had during their career, and possibly it comes from mentoring, it comes from from uh, being successful in, in various opportunities. And I think somebody said, you know, you have to be creative. And that's something that I've learned through my career is that, you know, you have to, you, you can't, you, it's, things come at you and you have to figure out what to do next. And it's not always what you think. And I think these people explain that. And trust your gut, I like that the best. I mean, you really, you know, don't do, you know, my grandmother always said, oh, you were a teacher, you are a teacher, and I didn't want to be a, yeah, she wanted me to be a grade school teacher. And it's like, oh, no, I can't do that. I didn't want to do that. But here I am in education now. So, um, but, you know, exploit your strengths. That was another point I think somebody made. But I'd like to open it up to other people. And any questions specifically for any of the career paths? Yeah, so to what extent did, you know, your personal life influence your career path? That does, that's Enormously, in my case. I don't think I would have gone into biochemistry if I hadn't had a boyfriend who was a biochemist. <laughs> I don't think I would have got obsessed with drug discovery and development if he hadn't gone into drug discovery and development. <laughs> so my personal life has had a huge sway on my career. Yeah. I think it's an important factor. Um, it's one that you have to, to take a personal approach to and decide how, how you're going to take it and what you do. And during your career, it has different different weights. My first wife said, I'll go anywhere with you while you post postdoc, but she didn't do it and then she left me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the second is that my, my delightful wife now, we make all the choices together. And it's, it's a bunch of different so I do think it's very important though, for you to think what, what is going to make you happy, personally. And that includes the environment, not just the the work, the choice, the research choice. Yeah, so for me as well, um, there's a lot of relationships I had that, that influenced anything. Um, my boyfriend at the time, we completely unsynchronized everything. He went overseas when I was still doing my PhD and I was finished and he wanted to come back so we swapped over and it just didn't work out. So, so that wasn't an influence at all. Um, but I wanted to go home, so I wanted to go back, I wasn't here, I wanted to go back to Africa and I knew it was a place that I could make a difference. Um, I had great opportunities at EBI. Um, Rolf was already talking about a possibility of one of his rolling contracts and it, the, the, it was really, and I, uh, the desire to go home was stronger and the lifestyle desire and the lifestyle was, for me was more important because I didn't want to spend so much time at work and then go home and do, not be happy. And so for me it was, you know, and I was being in my family and everything was important. So I had to then make that work. And I did. Other comments? So I noticed with all three of you at some stage you made a bold choice to break out of the kind of path you were in. What motivated that choice or decision? While you were thinking about it, I, I, I wanted to do I wanted to do something <coughs> I knew I could do. And there was nothing in a, there was nothing in the way. So there was nothing in the way and I, I pretty much knew I could do it. I was ambitious. I thought maybe I can do that, yeah, I'm pretty sure I can do it. So I went for it. It felt, it felt right, even if I had no idea how I was going to do it. Yeah, I guess also, uh, so for me, it was um, knowing that it wasn't a one-way road. If you didn't like it, you can change. It's the same with any career. So actually, if I had to give up science tomorrow and become, an, and I always thought I should be an architect because I like maths and I like art. If I had to give up science tomorrow, I thought, well, I've done that. I enjoyed it. Happy to move on. So this, it's, not, it's not like you, you're going to take a step and you never have the choice to come back. So I think that, that it gives you the safety net that you can try something else and it's okay. If, if it doesn't work out, you try something else again after that. I think with me it was a sense of um, not being able to go any further and enjoy it where I was. Uh, if, if you want 
want to continue a career in publishing after you've been an editor for 10 years, you tend to become a publisher. You go down the, the, bit, you know, the, 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 the business development route. I wasn't really interested in developing a business for nature publishing group. I was interested in the science. And so I started looking for something that would enable me to, 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 to continue doing science, but to do to do that broad overview stuff, not to focus in on one area of research, because by that point I'd realised that wasn't me. Uh, just uh, quickly, uh, Can you speak uh, up a little more? Uh, just a question that, um, uh, how do you feel to be the only lady in the lab? That, that was actually quite a challenge. It, 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 was, it was quite a nice <coughs> environment. And I was never subjected to any form of discrimination, but I, I had to muck in with the lads. I had to learn to muck in with the lads. And it was, and they, uh, yeah, a lot of them had very different lifestyles from me. They were, they were, they were capable of being in the lab at seven in the morning, having been to the gym for an hour, and working through till two o'clock in the morning, and then getting up and doing it all over again. And I, I wasn't capable of doing that. Um, and so, so you know, working in that kind of an environment, um, and, and, and not having any uh, any female role models was was quite tough, actually. Of course, at EBI, I had fantastic female role model because Janet Thornton was my boss for a long time, and she's just the most wonderful female role model you could ever imagine. Other questions? Yeah. How do you uh, know a good mentor? Somebody who's going to give you advice that's going to help you? Just look at where they are. So if they if they are in a place that you want to be, then they must have done something right. You know, you, you go into you, you approach them or they they approach you with the stuff giving advice. Um, but they give it to you, they don't talk bad. And it's awesome. They give you a very frank, they've got, they've got a view you just don't have, and they give you a very frank assessment of what's happening or where to go or how to do it. That's amazing. Uh, I've never been formally mentored until I went to Harvard. And I didn't know you could get mentored there. And the, the uh, academic dean was my mentor. Wonderful man. And he just gave me very gentle but incredibly wise advice. And I felt so so safe because I could just share everything. And you don't get anyone like that in your work day environment. You need to find people who really get it. That phrase is really important. I think for me it's about finding someone who shares the same values as me. Um, because then you can trust them to mentor you because you know that the advice you're giving the advice that they're giving you is going to be true to your values. So, just to add on to that, one thing that um, the Wild <coughs> Coast Act Association was trying to push into effect was um, having a second mentor, somebody outside of your department, somebody who has a different perspective, somebody from another institution. Um, and that can be very helpful too if you have a if you're a woman and you have a male supervisor. Maybe you want a female supervisor from another department or another institution. And, and you know, there are other ways in which you can do that, but that's something to think about as well. Other questions? Any regrets? <laughs> Nobody wants to share. <laughs>
into it, actually. I mean, there are probably little things that you regret along the way, but nothing major that would have such a huge impact. So, I guess it's more directed for, for you, Dr. I and everyone else in this. Um, so, at what point did you start listening to just your gut and stop asking for advice <coughs> and questions? Because I know a lot of young researchers are, you know, we all ask a lot of questions when we go into something we have no idea about. But there is a gut feeling. You have to, you have to realize that. And sometimes the questions fog our gut, or we're not sure if it's exactly what we need. Actually, it's a really good question. And I think I'm going to care to try and ask this in structure, but that's okay. Once again, it's faded. Sometimes, you know, depending on the value of the importance of the question. But, um, if you know you, I knew I wanted to go home to South Africa, so I wanted to find a means to do that. So I found somebody who was there, and I made a proposal to start an institute, and it happened. But it was, it, I knew I wanted to do that, and my gut was telling me that nothing else was. So that was a, not an emotional decision, it was just a draw. I knew I wanted to do research. Those are the things, you know, so you have the, you have the, the ethos, but then the implementation becomes an issue of interacting with people. But I'll tell you, um, moving to England was something that wasn't necessarily a gut reaction. That was a very reasoned process. And um, actually, um, deciding how to, what research I wanted to do in the last eight years, I started out thinking I really should follow along with what everybody does here and follow the formal career track and do what people think I should do. And after two and a half years, I Absolutely not. And I kept going for another year. So nearly three and a half years into it, I tried to do what I, what I thought was the right thing. And I wasn't being that successful at what people expected me to do. And then one day I said, screw this, I'm going to do, what I, I'll do things the way I can do it. And the minute I did that, I was much happier. And within a year, I raised great money and a good team, and I was flying. And I didn't stop flying, it was a change of plane direction. And I've kept with that, and it's quite a late career choice, but I used to do exactly what I thought I should do. I was happy, and taking too much advice, you know, we had some really good advice today from Carol, right, the how to write a grant. And that's, that's the formal didactics, if you like, of writing a grant, but, but you, you also have to trust your own style. And I want to finish off by mentioning a colleague of mine, Les Coxick, and you know, there's a very, very structured style, like Larry, I'm sure you are aware of this, a YouTube friend in, Writing a grant from the States to NIH, you've got to stay within, you supposedly have to stay within the very strict boundaries in order to have the review panel take you seriously. And a colleague of mine, Les Coblick, doesn't do that. He starts to look, well, there are three reasons you should fund this grant. You know, you, you, you know, he addresses the reviewer. You have a responsibility when you read this to think the following ways. And then he, he draws you in a, in a narrative that's like reading a, reading a literature, literature, a work of literature. Very hard science in there, but it's just different. It's not in a classic scientific style. And once you appreciate the depth and you get over the shock, it's wonderful. And you and he's a very successful scientist. And so, you know, this goes back to that issue. You have to follow your gut, but you do have to understand where people are going to revolt in terms of you know following the norms. And I think that boils down to you know letting your own um, specific strengths shine through. And, it, and as somebody else said, acknowledge your weaknesses and put them out there right in the front. So these are the things where we know we're weak. This is what we'll do it. Where I'm weak, I'll go with the focus on your strengths. People will bring, bring you on board based upon your strengths. Thank you. Thank you very good. Other questions? Yes. A question about dealing with stress. You look <laughs> like very stressless people, like you're sitting there. <laughs> 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 you look at a holiday for a but, week. I, I, I think that uh, science is actually a very stressful environment, at yeah. least it can be, and it's, it's very much self-imposed, right? There's yeah. almost no boss that said, okay, you have to do this, buy this, it's self-imposed. Mm -hmm. So how do you deal with that? Thank you, you put it back. So, yeah, I mean, one thing I actually went to set up, so I, I hadn't mentioned was that actually my job starts when I go to work, so I get to work at sort of 8, 30, 9 o'clock, I get home, I get my kid fed in bed and everything, and then I pick up my laptop again, and I go to 12, at least. That's every single day. And sometimes I actually look at, I walk into a store, and I look at people, and I think, you know, when you go home, you yeah. don't have to think about anything. So jealous. You don't have to think about <laughs> all the students that you're working with, you know. So it is hard, but it, but it comes and goes. 
so you have stressful periods and then you have a slightly, well, I, I can't remember when the last, the, the last <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess this is like, you, you need to put it into perspective. So at some point you can say, I've got so much to do, what is mission critical? And, and I should just put, the, what is going to affect too many other people? And what could I actually just put aside for between midnight and one in the morning? Mm -hmm. So it is stressful, but I think as long as you keep putting things back into perspective and saying, okay, I really wish I could have done all of these things, but what is the most important I can, I can deal with now? I also think it could be more, uh, you you're can be more comfortable with all this and something that Wynne said, which was being va feeling valued. Yeah. If you feel like what you're doing is good stuff, and it just it helps calm you down that you're really you, you're you're making progress and you're really helping the community, and I think that's that can help reduce it. And then you get to go play tennis or something and, mm -hmm. to really figure out. How much but it's it's a rat race, right? And you, it's so easy to spin out of control, right? So yeah, I think you have to do, let's qualify that. Yeah, yeah and, and you you have to learn to be kind to yourself. Yeah, you have to learn that. If you fall over, you're not going to do anybody any good. You're not going to do your team any good. You're not going to do your institute any good. So uh, it's a hard lesson to learn, and I think you know probably just about everybody in the room has come close, to <laughs> come close to, uh, to, to to tipping over the top at some point. But uh, you just have to learn that sometimes you need a break. You need to learn to say no. Yeah, you learn to say no, and I mean. I want to be very honest with everybody here, right? So this job I had in South Africa was not easy because I had to personally hold up a lot of things because there was nothing else to hold them up. And the stress upon me physically and personally was enormous. And it really got hard. And it started hard and it didn't get any easier. And it, was, it, it took an enormous toll on my life and my wife and my family. And uh, I was going to an acupuncturist and trying this and that and then, you know, when I took a break, and as I say, I went to Harvard, which was a capable comparison to the stress I used to feel, because I didn't have to personally carry so many other people's you know, careers and lives. Um, I'd actually got off the plane once, because we had, to, we had to raise money for a building, and I had to be there, and I had to get there from DC in a certain amount of time. I literally had to take a, you know, get from the airport to this meeting in, at my university. And after that meeting, I had to go to hospital. So it was very hard. The other side of that was um, understanding that that was a problem. And people started to talk to me about that. I was actually diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, although I never fired a gun. But I saw plenty of guns. And the issue was that I was scared of going outside, and all kinds of things happened to me when I started working hard. Very personal, very, I want to share it with you. Just so you know that you can grossly mismanage your stress. And you can be very, you can do yourself great service. And then I learned something. You're going to be just as successful if you set aside the time and become a smart Mickey. Right? And give, she always you know, says to me, when I'm not available, I say, why? I'm, I'm going to be your psychic in okay. <laughs> And now that's me. And thank you, Mickey, for that. <laughs> but um, it's me because now I walk eight minutes to home. Our home is 10 minutes from work. I don't commute anymore. I've got a great bike. I take it easy. I put my work away at five. Um, and that's because I've become super efficient at work. And there isn't a moment I waste when I'm working. And unfortunately, that means a lot of things don't get done as fast. But now I'm very happy at work, and I've got a lot into my kids and, and relaxing them. Because I, I just think you have to sort out who you are early. Because that's if you don't, you, you don't know who you're going to become. And have a good team. <laughs> awesome well, teams. Hire really carefully. Give them what they need to be successful. Don't get in their way, set them good goals, and you'll be great and happy. And at this point, I think we, although we could probably go on for another hour, <laughs> I think we should uh, thank our speakers and um, go down to the exhibit hall and go to the Goblet website, uh, the Goblet okay. exhibit. This is for Global Organization for Bioinformatics Learning, Education, and Training. And all of you should be members. Yay. <laughs>